We uh, were working to become teachers um, when we were at Reed College and, and uh, uh, were concerned at that time about uh, the number of students who were just sort of written off. They were not uh, successful and uh, not really expected to be successful in school. And uh, we noticed that these same children could learn every score of their favorite baseball team and rattle off the ratings and the statistics. And it wasn't that they weren't able to learn, it was that they weren't engaged in school. And uh, we, we wanted to bring the uh, excitement uh, of the sports team and the support of the sports team uh, to these students so that they could be successful in this very important part of their lives um, in, in learning as well as uh, in their, with their peers in sports. So we began to play with uh, cooperative learning structures uh, at that time. And uh, we knew we had to bring team celebrations uh, into the classroom. Uh, so that was one of the key elements that uh, we um, brought in first. So we asked kids to work together in teams, and we got them interested in, in working in teams by saying, uh, if you all uh, do a good job of learning, then your team will be successful. So in the typical classroom, what was happening was that the teacher would pose a question, uh, the students who knew the answer would raise their hand, the other students who didn't know the answer would hide, um, and uh, very few students were actively engaged, and those students who knew the answer weren't interested in the students that didn't, that they weren't asked to be um, interested and those students who didn't know the answer knew that they really didn't have a chance, so they might as well, you know, just stay quiet and, and not really be engaged. So in bringing teams into the classroom, we were changing that entirely so that those kids that did know something had a responsibility to engage their, their teammates and make sure they did learn, and those who had a chance to um, engage and explain and talk became, suddenly found out that they really did know a lot because they could share it with their, with their teammates. Um, so it, we uh, began to play with this idea, then went on to uh, teach for a while and, and then to do research um, at Johns Hopkins. We went all the way from one side of the United States to the other, and the United States is big. It's uh, not like Europe, which is tiny. Um, so we, we came to Johns Hopkins and, and did a lot of research because it, we found that while cooperative learning is very uh, quickly able to break down a lot of barriers in the classroom and create very positive uh, social interactions in the classroom and uh, create engagement, it doesn't always result in increased learning. And we wanted all of the social benefits of cooperative learning, but we also wanted to increase the actual learning of uh, all students in the classroom. Again, our concern, our initial concern was that some students were not uh, able to reach their potential. They were not learning what they could do, even though we knew they could. So we not only wanted the positive social results, we wanted uh, increased learning for students. So as we did the research, we found out that there were a couple of critical elements to ensuring that learning occurred. One was that, uh, all students had to demonstrate their learning individually. We call it individual accountability. Um, that learning could be demonstrated through a typical assessment where a teacher would give an assignment and would score that assignment. And then the team's results on those, on those assignments would be added together and uh, the celebration um, done for teams that did a good job. It could be on a piece of writing that students would write. It could be on uh, a set of oral responses that, uh, 
that students would give. So there are a wide range of ways to assess the individual learning uh, of students. Um, but it was critical that the individual learning be assessed. Many uh, folks who, um, who support cooperative learning uh, work sometimes by just providing uh, a product that the group does together. Um, when our children were in school, many times their teachers would uh, put them in groups where the product of the group was um, perhaps a report uh, or perhaps a uh, uh, diorama. Is that an English word? I mean, is that a Catalan word? Uh, or a product. But oftentimes, in our kids' experience, one child in the group completed that product rather than all children contributing uh, and learning. So we don't consider that the kind of cooperative learning that uh, will work, or it's not a matter of not considering that we've, we've done the research that demonstrates that that kind of group work does not result in increased learning uh, for students because it's not necessary for all students to demonstrate their learning. So that was one of the elements that we knew, uh, we determined through the research um, that was necessary for students to, um, to learn uh, more uh, in a cooperative learning structure. We also uh, determined uh, in our research uh, that students needed to have uh, team feedback. We uh, sometimes call that a team reward, but it's not really necessary that, it, that teams be rewarded, but it's necessary that teams get feedback on the uh, success of their work. It's not enough that kids simply do work together it's fun. It's better than just uh, inactively sitting and listening uh, to a teacher. But if there isn't feedback, there isn't the motivation to make sure that every member of the team is actually engaged and is working. So picture a classroom where, let's say it's a math classroom, uh, where kids are uh, Ten-year-olds are working on uh, learning how to do problems with fractions. Do you still teach fractions around here or just decimals? Fractions? Yeah. <laughs> um, so students are learning something that's a little complex and, uh, you know, something that's challenging to them. Uh, it's hard for another student to say, you didn't get that right you need to work on that harder. It, but if they're in a team where their team success depends on the fact that every child uh, in that group actually learns the material because they're going to have to demonstrate that learning uh, in the, each individually, then that gives kids permission to say, no, you have to work harder on that. You can't just let that go. You can't just accept that you can't learn that. You actually have to learn that. You have to master that. So that it gives kids permission to really demand from each other more effort and more work. And they get greater satisfaction for doing it. But if there isn't that team feedback frequently, there isn't that motivation to ensure that everybody is doing their best and, uh, and working hard. So I've gone well beyond how did we get started here. Um, one of the things that, that we note, and you know, I'll, I'll ask you, how many of you are teachers in, in the audience? Many of you are teachers. Most, <laughs> most of you are teachers. Um, in your experience, in, in your schools, um, is, is there cooperative learning used? Is that something that's common uh, in, your, in your schools? Raise, raise your hand if you see that commonly uh, in your schools. Often when, uh, often in the United States, and perhaps not here, and, and 
uh, I will hopefully hear more about that as you ask your questions. Often in the US, we see what is called, what we would call group work, but not what um, Bob and I would call true cooperative learning. Because if, um, if the interdependence, if true positive interdependence is not there, then again, the, the group doesn't have the motivation to ensure that all members of the team are working. So we make a distinction between group work and cooperative learning with the distinction being that positive interdependence, that students must all succeed in a group in order, to, in order for the group to succeed, that that's the hallmark of, of true cooperative learning. So, you know, I've talked about uh, the motivation that goes into true cooperative learning. Um, when we uh, celebrate team success, we often celebrate it with very simple uh, things like an announcement of the success of the team uh, to the class. Um, we have, uh, we've developed ways of ensuring that not just one team can be successful because that limits uh, the amount of celebration that can occur. But for instance, if, uh, if any team that is successful, any, any team that uh, achieves a score of 90%, on an assessment or a, an essay or an activity uh, is judged to be successful, then all teams that can achieve that, uh, that level can be successful. And if the team achieves an 80, maybe they're a great team as opposed to a super team. Very simple ways of sort of describing to a team uh, their level of success. Uh, these have been very powerful in uh, our work with schools. Uh, I'm thinking of a, a school, uh, a middle school right now. In, in the U.S., a middle school would be children who are 12, 13 uh, years old. Um, we had a project going on uh, again in math in, in this school. And in one classroom, what the most exciting thing that they could get if they succeeded as, their, as a team was to sit on these little yoga balls. So they had a set of yoga balls in the classroom and that was the success. Teachers find all kinds of ways of describing to kids uh, what their success is. Another class had a uh, stuffed animal and you know, teams that uh, did a great job got to have that stuffed animal sitting on their tables for the week. You know, it's, it's more the communication of success and the acknowledgement that the result of their work um, has been uh, significant learning that is the, the critical feedback uh, for teams. So that's what turns the dynamic from students worrying about their own success to having them be concerned and, and work hard for the success of their team. So one of the critical pieces, one of the critical things that occurs in effective cooperative learning is that students are giving each other explanations about their thinking and are not only um, hearing the explanations that other students are giving, but giving, their, giving explanations, articulating their ideas and having to find the gaps in their understanding and the gaps in their articulation and really rehearsing what it is that they are working on learning. This, uh, this, this process of both speaking and listening uh, is, engages the uh, synthesis uh, that students have to do in order to process and own the learning uh, that they're working on. It's the part that makes it go from passive to active. Now, I was thinking of doing a little simulation to make you all engaged, but I understand we have folks streaming out there, and I'm thinking that maybe we'll skip this. But imagine in your mind that I asked you to do this. <laughs> I was going to require you to actually chat with three people next to you and uh, share with each other your reason for coming today, and then synthesize among the four of you what it was about your reasons that was common. 
So the reason I selected that task is I wanted you actually to not just report, but to think and to come to a joint understanding. And then I was going to require you to all be prepared to report for your team. So one of the techniques that we've learned, uh, that we've developed as a part of our work in cooperative learning is called random reporter. And I was going to make you all uh, have the opportunity to be chosen as the random reporter. That means that I was going to ask you to number off one through four and then randomly ask one of you to be the reporter for your team. That is to say, I wasn't going to ask anyone to raise their hand. Uh, I wasn't going to let you know, let you choose for yourselves who was going to be the reporter. Uh, I was going to choose one of you randomly to be responsible for reporting uh, for your team. And that's the dynamic that we want to have going in the team. We want the team to be ensuring that each member of the team is ready to report on their learning, has actually learned it. And again, that takes it from a situation where I know that I learned it and I'm done. My responsibility in learning is done. Well, my responsibility in learning wouldn't be done until all members of my team understood the learning and was prepared to share their learning for the benefit of the team. So again, we call that little trick random reporter and it works incredibly well. If we have time, I'll uh, share with you another part of that trick, um, which is uh, developing a rubric to ensure that the quality of answers that kids give are very high. And uh, that's, that's the next level of trick that we have with, uh, with Random Reporter. In our form of cooperative learning, we use uh, four-person teams because four is a nice number. Uh, it's not too small and not too large. And that's about the level of sophistication we have with choosing the size of the group. Since, since uh, class size does not always, is not always divisible by four, we will have teams of five uh, if there are extra students and teams of five work well as well. And that allows students to have to work as pairs, to work as um, two pairs, or uh, to have discussions that are uh, rich and engaging without, with still giving children a, a chance to, um, uh, to be fully engaged and to talk. We have in our, uh, in our structure, we've, children aren't always coming to school ready to cooperate. It's something they often have to be taught how to do. So, um, and yet we don't want to spend all of our time teaching cooperation. We've got a lot of stuff we need kids to learn and to know. So we've developed some very simple, um, a simple mantra, <laughs> the poster on the wall that uh, is in every classroom that talks about what are the key skills involved in, um, in being a good member of a team, in working well as a member of a cooperative team. We teach kids active listening which means we teach them to, uh, how to give eye contact, how to sit facing uh, a speaker, how to acknowledge that they're listening with nods or yeses or restating uh, what their partner uh, has said or what their teammate has said. Um, it's interesting how difficult it is to teach active listening, but it's something that uh, is important uh, for kids to be successful. We teach kids how to explain their ideas, what that means, uh, and that telling why. It's not just you never give an answer. You have to explain that answer and elaborate it. Um, we teach them that, that it's their job to ensure that everyone participates, that they need to encourage their teammates, and that they need to complete their work. They need to stay on task and not wander off talking about their favorite sports team. So. So we talked about uh, some of the products that, uh, uh, that students um, might use as the basis for celebration and Random Reporter. Let me tell you one other great trick, by the way, to um, ensure that 
students are, are engaged even when the explanations are going on. Do, do you all know that uh, the term think, pair, share? Is that something that's familiar? familiar? No? Um, this is uh, just a way to quickly engage uh, children to talk. Um, and again, my goal is to never have a teacher ask a question and have children raise their hands. And this is hard to stamp out, let me tell you. It's very hard. But, but we try by teaching teachers that if they ask a question, they provide children with time to think. And then they ask them to pair, which is to speak to a partner uh, and articulate their thinking to speak it out loud and in a sentence, and then to share. And then that's when a partnership would share uh, the thinking that they have uh, been uh, talking about. So these tools can engage teachers who are just learning how to engage children in cooperative activities to become more engaged and more active. So, so we use techniques like this to, uh, to get teachers going. I wanted to share with you some comments from, from kids. And I'll read this one to you because it's in English. <laughs> it says, I love how we, do, how we are doing maths. I used to be rubbish at maths. Now I'm really good and I'm more confident of what I'm doing. So I like it. I love how we do our work with Team Mastery and Random Reporter. So they're actually talking about the techniques uh, that they've been doing. And the attitude is, is different. And this is from another student. Says this, I'm not sure I can even read that. This, this, ah, this team thing, right, has been good because we've been explaining the Oh, can you read that one? Explaining, Explaining it. Um, and I like that we do active listening. So <laughs> these from the teachers are more readable. <laughs> the program has raised my expectations of what the children can do, and it's also raised the students' own expectations of themselves. And another teacher said, my class is much more engaged in math lessons, and the children are enjoying talking about math. So again, the attitudes change, uh, the feeling is different, and it can be very a, a very quick transition. Um, so let me qualify that a little bit. So. In this particular uh, study that we actually did in England, and you can tell that because the teachers and students all say maths um, instead of math. Um, uh, this was a, a study where we invited schools to participate. And usually when we invite schools to participate, uh, we ask them to take a vote uh, about whether they'd like to change the way they teach, and we tell them about what the process would be. In the case of studies, it rarely happens so neatly because uh, you have to randomize for studies. Um, so teachers were never quite sure what they were getting into. But these teachers uh, were given a training session and given materials that were built to do cooperative learning uh, so that they were uh, team practice activities and were provided with coaching. And within a couple of months, we're doing an effective uh, implementation of cooperative learning. So my, my um, point is that uh, teachers can be successful at very large changes in the way they teach in a fairly short period of time if they are given uh, effective supports for changing. We learned how to work with teachers by uh, listening to what teachers had to say to us. When we started out, um, when we'd done our first 
research in cooperative learning, and, and uh, we're going back to the 1980s now. We're very old. Um, when we started, thank you, when we started working with teachers, we had these, this great knowledge from the research that we'd done, and we wanted to share it. We didn't want to just do research and publish it in, in nice journals and, uh, and have nice academic lives. We really did it to make a difference. And uh, so we started having workshops for teachers, and we invited teachers to come to Baltimore, and, uh, which is where Johns Hopkins is, which is why I keep talking about Baltimore. Um, and uh, they came for, for wonderful three-day workshops and uh, had great fun and were all excited and went back to teach in their classrooms. And when we checked with them a few months later, they would say, well, we really wanted to do it. It was a great idea. We really, really believe in it, but we just couldn't figure it out. It was too hard. So we said, well, what would help you? What would help you do it? And uh, they said, well, you know, we have to make all these team practice materials. And so we said, OK, we'll make team practice materials, and we'll just give it to you. So we began to make the materials that they asked for to make team practice easier, and uh, assessments to do the individual assessment of student learning. That's what teachers asked us uh, to do, and we did that. So then we gave workshops, and we provided materials. And still, when we asked teachers, um, how are you doing with this cooperative learning thing, uh, which they'd been very excited about at the workshops, they said, uh, well, we tried, but the other teachers in the school, they said that it was too noisy, so we gave up. Or they said, I, you know, most of my kids really liked it, but I had one kid that really couldn't get along with his team, so we gave up. And... Uh, so we figured out that there was something else that was needed. Besides a great idea and passion, there was a lot of skill that was needed as well. So we began providing coaching for teachers. And that coaching would entail going to their school and watching them teach and uh, giving them feedback uh, or talking with them and helping them, having them present their problems or engaging teachers in cooperative uh, groups in their schools and enabling them to have opportunities to problem solve with each other with the support of experienced uh, coaches. And those things made a lot of difference. We began to see teachers who could sustain a good implementation of cooperative learning as their standard way of approaching instruction. And that was very exciting. And we began to move from that into school-wide support of cooperative learning because if one teacher in a school is, is working with such a different way of teaching, there's peer pressure to give it up and to do things in a more standard way. And we found that to really sustain uh, a change in an instructional process, it was much more effective to have the school-wide collaboration in support of that change and that innovation. So that was, that was something that uh, became uh, very important uh, to sustain the changes that cooperative learning um, required. So I wanted to tell you a little bit at this point about uh, the work that we got into um, as our work became more mature. Uh, as we did this research and as we uh, got, you know, published some articles and things like that. We had uh, the folks from the school district in Baltimore come to us and say, you know, you're, you all in your ivory tower at Johns Hopkins, you know so much. Uh, we have students who are failing all the time. At that time, which was, you know, still back in the 80s, 50% um, uh, of Baltimore City's students did not succeed uh, in graduating from high school. Half the students in the city didn't graduate, and they dropped out. Um, they just gave up because they saw no uh, chance of actually being successful in school. 
So the, the school district came to us and said, you know, we want to work with you to, to create success for kids. They said if you had everything you needed and uh, could ensure that students were successful, what would you do? So we talked with them for a, several months, and uh, we said, well, you would need to first change the culture in the classroom and change the instructional process to a cooperative process. That would be part one. And then you would have to ensure that uh, students who were beginning to fall behind had extra time so that they could take advantage of what was going on in the classroom. So we set up tutoring structures to ensure that students were successful. We chose reading as the core, learning to read. We were starting with elementary schools. And we, we decided uh, that reading was the critical thing. If students can't read, then they're not going to be successful in school. So getting kids to be successful at learning to read was, was the goal, was the most concrete goal that we took on. We knew that for kids to be successful, uh, they would need to be in school every day. In Baltimore, that wasn't something that was common. In uh, elementary school, at that time, the attendance rate for first graders, you know, it's, that's when it's the highest, where it was 80%. 80% of first graders were getting to school every day. That's not enough. Um, so we put in uh, plans to ensure that students were in school and that they were in school on time and that uh, when they got to school, they weren't hungry and that they had had adequate sleep. So we had to engage their parents in um, making sure that they were supporting their children. And sometimes that was solving the social problems that the parents had. And other times it was simply making sure that the parents weren't afraid of the school and could partner with the school. And sometimes it was teaching parents um, how to just celebrate with their children what they had learned in the evening. So we developed a, a fairly complex program that we called Success for All. And we started uh, in a school in Baltimore. This turned out not to be just an academic discussion, but something the school district wanted to do. So in 1987, we began with one school. And at the same time, we had a second school that was very similar. So we had two very similar schools. And we, um, we used these tools that we had talked about uh, in this first school. And uh, in one year, we had students who had gained um, a year and four months worth of learning. And this was in a school that was failing. So with the additional resources, with all of the structures, we were able to make substantial gains in a short time. Uh, we continued this project and expanded to new schools um, over the next five years. And we, we took a look at these kids who had been doing using this program for five years. And uh, we found that the assignments of students to special education uh, identification were reduced by more than half. And the number of students required to repeat a grade, which is what you do if you t utterly fail, was cut by two thirds. And we found that on the assessments that the schools typically gave to measure their own progress, um, that the schools made, I don't know, do effect sizes make sense to you? Three quarters of a standard deviation of difference? It was a big effect. It was uh, significant. It was educationally meaningful. These children were a full year ahead of the children who were in uh, the comparable school by, by this time. That year was enough to make the difference between staying in school and dropping out of school. It gave children the sense that they could be successful. And the students who uh, had been in our pilot school uh, stayed in school and we measured by eighth grade they, the dropout rate, which had already begun to, by eighth grade in, in, uh, in Baltimore, students were beginning to drop out. Our students had not dropped out. So it, uh, the, 
there's incredible power in doing what we can using the research uh, for children. If our schools aren't using the research that we have and is available, then we're not giving our children uh, what they deserve. Teachers don't want to change their practice. There's just not much you can do uh, to require them to do it. So it, it often happens that in the schools that we work in with Success for All, we, we take a vote and uh, we ask the staff to have a, a secret ballot and uh, to vote whether to um, change, whether to take on Success for All uh, or not. And uh, we don't say 100%, though. We say 80%. And we find that some teachers aren't ready to take it on, but if their whole school decides that they're going to do this together, that um, that becomes an agreement uh, that they make, and, and they will do that. Um, so having that uh, agreement is is a good start. And in schools where that isn't possible, sometimes it does work to have um, a teacher who is eager to be the first to take the plunge and to start the ball rolling. Um, as long as it's part of uh, a discussion to talk about what are the changes in practice. Um, which, when we work with teachers, we, uh, we start with an introductory workshop. It's usually one day. Uh, we don't usually do more than that um, because you have to try it. <laughs> you have to get your feet wet. And uh, we do provide fairly structured materials when we start that give teachers an easy way to get started. We say, you, you can teach this lesson, teach for 10 minutes, engage kids in uh, partner practice, peer practice, team practice, and this is where they're gonna be aiming. You know, They're gonna be aiming for this, they're practicing this, everybody knows what it is that they're aiming for and how to be successful. And then they'll practice for a few days and at the end of that time, have an assessment of some kind and find out. Were they successful? Some teams will be successful. Some will be more successful than others. And that's the beginning of the conversation because there's feedback. And when that cycle begins is the beginning of a continuous improvement process, not of a mastered cooperative learning process. So if kids are engaged in that discussion as much as teachers are engaged, and if teachers have a team of support of, of other teachers to have that conversation going, then they keep trying it and they, they learn how to do it better and better. So if teachers are just um, in a cooperative process with no goals and no feedback, then you will never feel that you've mastered cooperative learning because you're just chatting and it's fun, but you're not necessarily getting to the learning. You're not evaluating, you're not goal setting, you're not um, finding out whether you were effective as a cooperative group or not. And there are ways to be effective or less effective as a cooperative group. Um, so again, we'll, we'll do a workshop and then we'll keep track of uh, the success and have, you know, have the, uh, the meetings and, and observations to find out how it's going and, and keep working at it. So that brings me to who can come in my classroom and who can't. Um, we assume in, uh, in a cooperative learning situation that anybody can come into anybody's classroom, um, that it's a shared process and that uh, everybody's learning. And so we have had, we've worked in school districts where there are union rules against that. Um, and we'll work around it if necessary, but it's much more productive if people can share and can see and ask questions. And it's, uh, if it's a cooperative process, then it's not evaluative. It's for the purpose of learning. So we've, we've had uh, success uh, in doing that. And of course, coaches have to come into the classroom or else they can't be of much assistance. So that's one of the uh, expectations that, that we have when we're engaging in the process. So in the early years, um, there are 
they're, because cooperative learning can be used across the age span, um, there do have to be sort of differences in the structures. So in the early years, again, it's often partner activities that uh, make up a lot of the activity, partner reading for kids when they're uh, in beginning reading activities in six-year-old at the age of six are, are very, very powerful. Think pair share is something that we use a lot uh, in the early years. Um, and doing a lot of teaching about how to be supportive of your peers. Again, we teach active listening um, from the earliest ages that uh, we work with kids. And uh, so kids learn how to partner. It becomes part of the curriculum. So don't know how else to be specific about that unless we get down to the nuts and bolts. <laughs> People think they're doing cooperative learning, but they're really not m doing uh, that much of it. Um, and how do you actually increase it? And how do you how do you ask people to utilize more effective um, kinds of cooperative learning? Um, so one of the levers that you have to use is why do people want to change? Uh, why do they want to do something different? Um, if they're completely happy with, uh, with what they're doing, they're, again, not going to put the effort in to make a change, because change is hard. Um, so sometimes they have to be assisted in finding a reason to change. And, and that's where good school leadership um, or inspiration from peers can, uh, can go a long way. Uh, or self-reflection, even an invitation to uh, to reflect and say, you know, how engaged are your children? How many of your children are achieving the levels of success that you'd like to see them achieve? You know, are you stuck, or are you really seeing uh, the success that you want to see? And often, when teachers reflect, they will find that well, a certain percentage of their kids are engaged and achieving, but they've got a, a group of kids who are not. And then that can become the lever for, well, let's see if we can get all students engaged. And you know, let's look at some of these strategies that uh, the research says make a difference. And uh, we like to use evidence as, as one of the tools and say, well, you know, there's research that says that if you do this and this and this, then you can get even better achievement. And, and do you aspire to that? Uh, for your students. And, and again, that's where leadership can come in to increase teachers' expectations for themselves and for their students. Um, sharing classrooms is a good idea, so long as the models that you're sharing are illustrating the techniques that you want to illustrate. And, and we are pretty picky uh, ourselves about um, what the elements of effective cooperative learning are. Because again, we don't just want to increase the social, uh, to, re to achieve the social benefits of cooperative learning. We want to achieve increased learning. We want uh, students to be more successful in achievement. Um, and that means that kids have to have this positive interdependence. They have to demand learning from one another. They have to demand hard work from each other. Um, so we do want to see the feedback loops, and we do want to see the individual accountability uh, in our cooperative learning classrooms. So we will bring those issues up. Uh, and if we're having a teacher model, we want those aspects of it to be uh, included in the model. So we would not just want a teacher who had good group work going on, but a teacher who had uh, real positive interdependence going on. There is a problem when, when cooperative learning is built just around roles because, again, what, what are the roles? There are really the leader and the reporter, aren't they? Um, so we often do st structure other roles in some of our activities in a, in a discussion of a piece of writing, um, in, a, in a discussion of a text. We might have someone who poses a question someone who articulates an answer, someone who agrees or disagrees with that answer, and someone who summarizes what the discussion was, so that we have more than uh, one role to help kids begin to understand how to engage each other. But then we, what we really want to teach kids is to celebrate uh, constructive 
criticism and disagreement. Um, and we will have our teachers give kids feedback and say, you know, I'm not hearing enough disagreement here. You're not challenging each other to get to a high level uh, of discussion and a high level of response. When we do random reporter in the context of uh, talking about pieces of literature uh, in particular, we will, uh, we, we want kids to prepare each other for a high level uh, discussion. We want them to be a, a high quality reporter for their group. So they can't just, you know, have a question and give an answer. They have to be able to articulate the reasons for that answer and the references from the text that support the answers that they're giving. So this is the rubric that I was talking about. You know, giving an accurate answer to a question about a, a text might be an 80 point answer. Being able to say that answer in a complete thought might be a 90 point answer, but you can't really get the full points for being a reporter for your teammates unless you can cite uh, the evidence from the text that uh, is support that supports the answer. So that's one way of teaching teachers how to keep high expectations for students. And I will tell you that teaching teachers to do that in the US, I don't know about Catalonia, but uh, in the US, it's very hard to get teachers to hold kids to a very high standard. They want to be nice. They want to say, that's a good answer, you know, and then they'll have another student maybe elaborate that answer. But that says to the student, I don't really expect that, I don't expect complete work from you. Uh, the response should be, well, that's a start, but next time ask your team to prepare you better with the full, uh, you know, with some citations from the text regarding your response. If it's fed back directly to the student and to the team, it's not this, just the student, so you're not criticizing a student, you're asking the team to do a better job. It gives, uh, it gives power to the team that can raise expectations, but it's very hard for teachers because they feel that they're criticizing a child. It has to be directed back to the team. Sometimes it's the kids themselves, but it's often the parents feel that if they're being asked to work in a cooperative group, that because they're the smartest kid in the class, they must be you know, not fully challenged because they're helping kids do work that their child already knows. Well, the research on this is fairly clear. We've done many studies and we've looked at the kids that start in the bottom quarter of the class and those that are in the top quarter of the class and, and those in the middle. And we've looked at the results for those groups separately. And we find that the students in the top quarter of the class achieve at a higher level than the top quarter of the class in the comparison group, because we're always using a comparison group. So that's our data. The fact is you can document uh, greater learning uh, even for the high achieving students in the group. So cooperative learning does not put kids at a disadvantage. If you think about it, as teachers, you know that when you teach something, you learn much more about your own understanding of it than you knew before. Uh, so there's value in even asking high achieving kids to process their thinking, to take the perspective of another, to break it down in a way that makes sense uh, to other children, uh, and that that benefits their own understanding and their own learning. And, and that's what the data uh, are saying. We do in our groups, and I'm not sure if I made this point, um, we do uh, have the teacher create the groups uh, in our form of cooperative learning. We don't ask students to self-select their cooperative groups. And we assign the groups to be heterogeneous as heterogeneous as possible within the classroom, so that they're mixtures of boys and girls, and they're um, cross, they're one high kid and two middle kids, and one lower achieving kid uh, in the group, and they're cross ethnicities, and they're as heterogeneous as you can get uh, within the classroom. Um, and we do that for a reason, because we want the different 
Uh, we want the groups, uh, first off, we want the teams to have an equal opportunity to succeed as teams. We want them to all be successful. Uh, and so we, we try to create level teams and we try to create the bridges across those uh, barriers in the classroom. Uh, so we, we do get those questions of what do you do with the high achievers because you're not sending the high achievers off in a group of their own to do advanced work. You're asking them to participate in the, in the work of the, of the entire group to succeed. Technology is, uh, is a fantastic thing and uh, schools will someday learn how to use technology. I'm not sure they know how to use technology now. At least there's not a whole lot of evidence that technology benefits the achievement of kids uh, at this point. I think learning to use technology is a fantastic goal. It's something that uh, we all do uh, in our professional lives and kids need to learn. But technology is not, um, is not a necessary uh, element, a necessary tool in cooperative learning. That's a, an instructional process. You can use cooperative learning to learn how to do technology, certainly having kids help each other uh, toward those goals uh, is certainly wonderful. Um, technology is, I think, often used as part of project-based cooperative learning and is a great tool for finding information. So um, I think technology in a cooperative classroom is uh, it's a tool, as it would be in any classroom, a writing assignment just to be different. Math, I think you can all conceptualize in, in math. You have a task to learn in math. Perhaps it's a problem solving task. Kids need to uh, take a complex problem about, uh, oh, rate and distance is always fun. Uh, the, can, if you go by car to, uh, um, let's see, Girona, uh, versus taking the train, and the car goes at this rate, and the train. So math is a great, so many opportunities for kids to think and discuss. So what we would do in math is um, uh, have a challenge uh, placed before the kids. The teacher, you know, will have presented it, and and uh, and the kids will start by talking through the kind of uh, problem as a group and coming up with a group answer. And then we'll try it on their own. Each individual child will try um, a version of the task, another problem, and practice and ask their um, teammates for assistance as they practice and, uh, and you know, continue in that vein either having uh, what we call team huddle, which is the whole group talking together, or team mastery, which is the individuals mastering it on their own and then uh, um, checking with each other. Both of those techniques would be used until the, until the groups have mastered the challenge and there's a, a time for an assessment. So that's sort of the basic structure. We call it the cycle of instruction. You know, it's a brief instruction by the teacher, it's team study, um, it's assessment, and then celebration. So those are the four parts of the cycle, and they're not rigidly adhered to. They go back and forth as needed by the lesson. So take a writing lesson, a cooperative um, writing task. So perhaps the task is to write uh, a persuasive argument in response to uh, a text that the group has been reading. So to start, uh, the teacher might provide the rubric uh, against which the uh, product will be judged so that kids know that a persuasive argument needs to have a premise. It needs to have um, the arguments laid out with some detail, and it needs a summary. Those kinds of things might be the elements of a, um, of a persuasive argument that the teacher wants to lay out with as much detail as they want. Kids would be uh, asked to brainstorm with their teams to come up with um, some planning ideas. What is their topic? What, what uh, position are they going to take on, on what uh, argument and uh, what details might they add to it? And uh, how are they going to get started? Students would then individually go and draft, write their draft, and then come to, back together 
and have a revision conference uh, with the team where each team member may read their um, essay and get feedback uh, against the rubric from their teammates. They would then go and complete revisions, perhaps have another conference, um, and then at some point come up with a final product. There are lots of interesting ways to um, have writing uh, products scored by other students rather than always by the teacher. I don't know if you find this, but often in high schools that have 140 kids in their class, if you assign an essay, that's a solid week of scoring essays. You can't read them as fast as the kids can write them. And you want them to write them a lot. So there are some great uh, peer scoring uh, tools out there. Uh, there's one, and here's a great use of technology. Uh, there are some crowd scoring tools that are getting developed uh, where, say, three students would rate an essay on a rubric that you've all talked about and agree on. And if the three scores are discrepant, then the teacher would score it. And if the three scores aren't discrepant, then that score would stand. And what happens then is teachers will assign much more writing because they don't then have to grade it all uh, individually. So those are two examples of uh, different kinds of activities that might occur. I think that you know, if they're sharing the teaching job with the students, that somehow that um, uh, diminishes them. But I think that uh, there is the role of the teacher is critical in ensuring that the learning is directed at the goals uh, that are uh, important in the in the class or in the task. Uh, so I don't think that the role of the teacher changes. I think that the process that the teacher uses to get to their outcomes changes, and that they buy students in in a different way and interact. They are no longer the, the sole distributor of knowledge, but I don't think that that makes them any less critical because try to imagine a classroom with no teacher. Um, it, it won't gel at all. It won't have a goal. It won't have a process. People just filter into a room and then filter out again. The, the goal is not there. So teacher's still critical to the cycle, but it, the teacher creates a much more engaging and interactive cycle than, uh, than in the typical stand and deliver or lecture uh, format. So I don't see it as um, taking anything away from the teacher. I think it's, it's adding richness to, uh, to what they do. Um, and I agree absolutely that uh, in order to change, teachers need to understand the rationale. Uh, they need to have a reason for change and a need for change um, and to know why uh, they're doing it. And again, that takes leadership. It takes uh, someone guiding the teacher and the school to I mean, teachers sometimes think they operate in a vacuum, but in, in fact, they operate as a part of a system that is there to benefit uh, our students and our children and to give them the tools that they need to be effective um, citizens and effective adults. So their job isn't just to um, you know, get through the day. Their job is to create real learning for kids. And when we... Uh, can effectively engage teachers in reflection around the bigger issues, they'll get to that understanding as well. I don't have much to say about architectural barriers. Um, I think, uh, again, with respect to cooperative learning, uh, you can do it in whatever kind of architecture you've got. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, you know, that can be worked around how is the individual assessment done uh, in order to create you know, the documentation of individual learning? And again, there are a variety of ways depending on where you are in the cycle. The easiest way is a written product that each child produces, that each child or student um, or university uh, adult produces in order to demonstrate their learning. That's the simplest way to do it. But um, again, in our, some of our reading uh, instructional groups, we will have, um, we'll choose a student randomly using Random Reporter, have a student report for, on the discussion of their group, 
record the quality of that response. And then over the course of a week, we'll have an, a sample of a response from each child, from each student, and we'll collect those and use those as the uh, individual evidence. Um, uh, there are an infinite number of ways to, uh, to collect that individual demonstration of knowledge that then goes to create the team product and the team celebration.